Hello, my quilting friends. Leah Day here with episode 46 of the podcast. And today I'm going to be talking with my good friend, Anne Holmes, about her awesome quilting technique, no sewing until you quilt it. It's basically a method of constructing your quilt without having to sew, without having to do any piecing at all. And this has been a technique that I've used a lot. I've used it in many quilts over the years, and it was a real game changer for me because it was one of the first applique techniques I ever learned. Anne was a member of a quilt guild that I joined when I first started quilting. So she really was a very pivotal quilter in my life. She taught me something really important, and we've remained in contact and good friends ever since. So that's been really nice to have her on this show, and I really hope that you enjoy this interview and learn something new from Anne and her assistant, Rachel. So I hope you're looking forward to this conversation. So what am I doing today? I am making lunch. <laughs> this is a big part of what I've been doing a lot lately, and that is stopping in the middle of the day to cook something. Uh, a lot of times I'll eat leftovers from whatever we had the night before, but today I had some acorn squash, and I shared this recipe two weeks ago in the newsletter, but I'll make sure to link it up in the show notes again. Basically, I'm browning some sausage, and throwing in some apple and rosemary and caramelized onions, and then I'm gonna use that as stuffing in some eight, half of an acorn squash that I've already roasted. So super, super yummy. And I gotta say, I feel really great. I'm on the third week of my Whole30 diet, and you can listen to the last two podcast episodes, and you'll hear a lot more about that. Uh, last episode, I was chatting with my sister, Camille, about being on Whole30. She was really the inspiration for why I went on this diet. And then the week before that, I shared, you know, all the reasons why, all that good stuff. So definitely go back and watch those episodes if you're interested in learning more about Whole30 or why I went on this diet. I'm feeling great and I, I haven't weighed myself, but I feel smaller, which feels great. And I haven't tried on those pants that stopped fitting before. <laughs> I haven't tried those on yet, but I'm pretty sure that they would fit now. And that feels really good too. Uh, so it's been an adventure and learning how to, not really learning, but just getting into the habit of stopping to cook myself lunch and to take better care of myself has been really big. And I think it's something that needed to happen anyway. Uh, and a lot of times I would just cop out with lunch and it would just be like whatever I could grab and usually something not all that great for me. And then I'd stay really stressed out and like rush, 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 rush all day. So this has been a good moment to kind of slow down and kind of take stock and see, hey, what is the most important thing that I need to get done for the rest of the day? And that's been really helpful. So a couple updates about what's going on around the house. Uh, let's see here, this week we finished up, officially finished up the rainbow log cabin quilt. It is completely done. And I shared a massive three-part binding tutorial. You can learn how to prepare your binding, how to stitch it onto your quilt, so that way you can finish the whole thing by machine, and then how to finish it by machine. So that's the third part, finishing it on the machine by stitching it down. So you only have to take just a few stitches in every corner by hand and that finishes it off with really nice, beautiful mitered corners. So definitely come and check it out. You can find all of the tutorials for that linked up. Um, just go to leahday.com slash binding. That's L-E-A-H-D-A-Y.com slash binding. And that's really going to be the best place to start. That kind of puts you in the middle and then you can click and find the links to the preparation video and also the finishing video. And I really worked hard on those images. <laughs> I put a lot of effort into those in images. Uh, I took a lot of photos of um, different quilts, not just rainbow. I took a lot of pictures of quilts that I finished previously. Um, you know, just shared a lot of different things and really tried to make them look pretty for Pinterest. So it would mean a lot to me if you would come and check out that tutorial and pin some images. It helps me out a lot. Uh, so that is Rainbow Log Cabin finished up. I'm still working on Marvelous Mosaic. You can find tutorials on this quilt shared every single Friday. So we're stitching out a different walking foot quilting design in a nice big square so you get some good practice and learn some new walking foot quilting designs. And I've been thinking, you know, the spoon flower kick I'm on and designing fabric, what if I designed a walking foot whole cloth? Well, I already have the whole cloth. I guess I could put that up on spoon flower, but I could also put up some like um, just, 
more simple designs designed for walking foot quilting. That would be the fabric kind of printed and intended to be followed with walking foot quilting. So I've been thinking about that and um, I have not had very much time to play with the fabric design stuff. I have been drawing, but I haven't had time to get it to the computer. So this week, my task is to get those designs that I've been playing with into the computer, into Adobe Illustrator and draw them, play with them, get it all done. And I think the reason why I didn't get it done this week is because Quilty Box came in and it was like, all of a sudden my brain was just completely diverted <laughs> because Quilty Box came in and you know, a lot of different times we'll, we'll, we'll get different rulers, okay? And different templates and stuff like that. And I can be a little judgy, I'll be completely honest. Um, unless the template's really well designed, I really don't wanna use it. Um, and things like, you know, flying geese, I, I don't really feel like I need to use a ruler for a flying geese. But this ruler, it was, um, let's see here, uh, Jaybird Quilts. Sidekick ruler. This thing is awesome. It is extremely well designed and it cuts diamonds and triangles that you can use to make a tumbler quilt. And I've been wanting to make a tumbler quilt for a while. This has been on my list. And so it's kind of like diving down the rabbit hole. <laughs> as soon as I realized that this ruler would cut tumblers, uh, sorry, the, the diamond shapes to make the tumbling blocks design. Well, then it was, it was, it was all done. I, I had to make one, but the fabric that came, we got a lot of fat eighths, which is not a lot of fabric and you know, nice, beautiful variety of colors. Got a nice arrangement of colors that I was able to use, but just not a lot of everything. So I ended up cutting lots of little itsy bitsy pieces. <laughs> and so I ended up with this quilt that is literally this big made with hundreds of pieces but it was worth it. It was worth the tangent. And I, I did some Instagram posts and stuff. I was like, what am I doing? You know, I'm busy and I've got all this stuff to do and all these things. Like, why am I running off on this tangent to go piece these itsy bitsy tiny triangles and diamonds together? And sometimes you just have to do that. And this is what I felt like I really needed to do this week. And that was my great work this week. And then now all of a sudden I'm designing uh, worksheets. I wanna, I wanna make some Tumblr worksheets so that you can draw these easily and you can plan out your quilt really easily and play with it because I think that this is such a cool way to make a quilt. So I don't know where this is all going. We'll know by this time next week because my deadline to get all of this up, I wanna get it all up by Monday the 26th of February. So you'll be looking forward to my crazy tumbling block mini quilt <laughs> tutorial that'll be coming out next Monday. So that is really what I've been majorly busy with this weekend. That's what I've been just piecing, piecing, piecing up a storm. And while I was doing that, I caught up on a lot of podcasts. And my favorite podcast I listen to the most is The Creative Pen. I think I mentioned that a few times in this podcast. Just, she, you know, uh, Joanna Penn is the um, creator of that podcast. And she really inspired me to start my podcast because I love the way that she shared her own journey about her business and then also an interview with somebody else and kind of pick their brain about how they did what they did. Uh, I loved that whole format. I loved everything about it. And then she really inspired me to get back into writing, which I really had kind of just been like, you know, books, whatever. And she really encouraged me hearing her experience and, you know, learning more about self-publishing was really her inspiration. So I was listening to a lot of her episodes while I pieced this little quilt and worked on it. And something that was really interesting in one of her recent episodes was about um, writing a letter to different things, like writing a letter to money, writing a letter to your business, uh, writing a letter to your future self. I know this is a little woo-woo, but um, I really like the idea of writing a letter to my business. And so I sat down and did that one evening. I was just like, that's really kind of, like, for some reason, that was just something that I really felt like I needed to do. And it was so interesting, you know, to write, you know, kind of visualizing my business as something, you know, not, not that I have created, but just something separate from me, like a person I could have a conversation with. And it was like, dear Daystyle Designs Incorporated, doing business as leahday.com. And it was like, from right there, I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much loaded in that name, even that uh, I started realizing I had a lot of regrets about my business and a lot of things I've been holding against my business. And I mean, it was, it was kind of crazy and um, eye-opening just writing this letter and, and kind of digging into this stuff. And by the end of it, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, now I'm starting to feel this amazing gratitude. Like, 
we have done something really good together. I know this sounds crazy, I really do, but it was really helpful. Um, I wrote a letter to money too, which, you know, I think everybody can have, you know, issues with money and kind of that weird relationship with money. I was certainly raised hearing we're not good with money. And that was kind of, that was always kind of in my psyche, like, we're not good with money. You know, we spend too much. That kind of thing was repeated a lot in my house growing up. And I've had to unlearn that, you know, I've had to really work on that. And it was interesting um, how I, that letter went very differently. And it was like, you know, I, I think we're good friends and I, I'd like to do more with you. <laughs> Can we meet up more often? <laughs> Something like that. Uh, and so that was interesting too. Uh, and it definitely made me realize that um, holding on to things like, you know, silly little things that I have, I've held on to and like held against myself about my business. Like, oh my gosh, you never wrote that book you said you were going to write. Or you never finished that blog post that you were supposed to finish. Or, you know, those are terrible photos all over your site. You need to update them like right now. Um, and I have been holding all these things against myself and tapping into that gratitude has really forced me to change my mindset and be like, wow, you know, my business supports me. It supports my family. I could not send my son to school. I could not pay my bills. I could not pay my dad to work with us every day if it wasn't for this business. And so that gratitude really came out. And now it was like, how do we collaborate better? How can I work and be happier and feel less frazzled all the time? And I feel like my business needs to write a letter back to me. <laughs> This is so weird. So I'm probably going to have my business write a letter back to me uh, this week. Uh, just kind of thinking through what my business probably would be like. Can you just calm down and like stop obsessing about stuff that nobody cares about? Can you just be yourself and have fun and make this more fun and stop agonizing over everything? Like I'm sure that's what day my business would tell me. Um, so yeah. That's, that's what I, a major thing that I did this week, and I have been writing a lot, thanks to listening to all those podcasts, very inspiring, uh, and really worked a lot on Mally the Maker, uh, got a lot of really nice people writing in to be early readers, thank you guys so much, uh, and I'm really looking for just somebody that would be entertained by the book, not critical. <laughs> Like, obviously, yes, I want to know if there's something really annoying left in the book, but really um, just needing, this is my first book. I, I can't really, and Josh was kind of like, I'm not sure that you should have sent out that kind of thing to the universe because your first book, is, and, and this isn't my first book, but it is my first fiction novel. It's a, it's a delicate point. And, you know, if I get a whole lot of criticism and fear coming in really hard, I might never release it. It might be like, oh no, you know, it needs to be perfect. It needs to be perfect. Um, so what I'm asking for is kindness and um, gentle nudges in the right direction, that kind of thing. Uh, and really, you know, just, just nice kind input more than anything else. And so that would be really nice. If you're interested in being a early reader, then definitely contact us, leahday.com slash contact. Now, a little bit about the book. A lot of people have been asking about it. It's an adventure story. So it's quilting, but an adventure fantasy story about a little girl. She's 10 years old. And I'm going to tell you two things. Uh, her grandma's gone missing. Her grandma's been missing for six months. And there is a quilt involved. And it is a magical quilt. <laughs> so, yeah, it's awesome. I'm reaching the end. Uh, kind of have it all storyboarded out. It's really coming together in a solid way, and I'm excited about it. And there's so many things that I want to do from this. I want to make the quilt. I want to make stuffed animals from the story. I want to make all of the quilts that I mentioned in the quilt, because, of course, the grandmother is a quilter, uh, and all of that stuff. It kind of really feels like there's a lot here that I can tap from and pull from in many different styles and many different quilts to create, and that's really exciting. Um, it feels like I've created a new world, and in a way I kind of have, and it's something different, and um, it feels very light. And that was another thing that I was really like, why do I tend to feel so bogged down and kind of heavy? And it's like, well, it's probably all that junk I'm holding against myself, right? Mally feels very light and carefree, like it's brand new and I haven't screwed it up yet. <laughs> you know, I mean, 
some of those things. I think, um, I, I think all of this is an evolving process and I'm, I have bought the domain name, mallythemaker.com. Don't go there. There's nothing there yet, but there will be. Uh, I have some plans for some really simple tutorials because really this book is written for quilters, obviously, but it's also written for children. And I really want kids to read it and be inspired to hand stitch because all in the book, the only form of stitching is hand stitching because that's how I started. I didn't, I didn't have a sewing machine. The sewing machine I did have, I didn't know how to use it very well. So I always fell back to hand stitching until, really until about ninth grade. So Mally's 10, she's gonna be learning hand stitching. That's how she's gonna be making her quilts. That's how she's gonna be going through her adventure. And I really wanna do some tutorials on that. It's been inspiring for me. Um, I, I really like all of this. It's just, it's really, it is exciting. Um, so yeah, more coming soon on that. And what else has been going on? So yeah, just mostly writing. I did not get to Dream Goddess this week. That was largely because of Quilty Box. And, but my goal is to finish that, to get that last bit of quilting done by the end of the month. And I still got a little bit of time. So by this time next week, I should be sharing an update and getting some more done on that. I have to say one thing, we did get a Nintendo Switch for Valentine's Day and yeah, a lot of my time has just gotten sucked up <laughs> into playing uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild, which is an amazing, humongous game that is just, I sat down, I'm like, I'm gonna go find a shrine. And then I get distracted by 50 million different things that are super, super cool to go check out. And then an hour has gone by and it's like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> What just happened, you know? So I have to be really careful with that. I have been getting a few questions on Instagram, like, oh my gosh, how do you do it all? You know, that kind of thing. Like, do you have more hours in your day? And I'm probably gonna do a podcast just specifically on this soon. But basically, you know, it's all about habits. Uh, I've been thinking about that a lot this week. I wake up early. I get up at, you know, if I'm getting up with James, then I get up at 545. If it's Josh's week, then I still get up at seven. And I don't always wanna get out of bed that early. I am sometimes very sleepy and dad doesn't come in until nine. I could go back to bed and sleep, but I don't. Because if I go back to bed and sleep, I will have no writing time. That's my, early in the morning is my writing time. So how I wrote Mally the Maker and created this world and created this book is 30 minutes to an hour every day for four months. That's it. You know, it's getting out of bed. It's being willing to, to be sleepy a little bit and start the day an hour earlier, put that little bit of writing time in and then go on with the rest of my day. Cause I don't have time to sit down and have these long glorious hours and hours and hours to work on it. I haven't had that. So this has been put together in 30 minutes to one hour sessions, really careful outlining and, you know, keeping it always in the back of my head. How is the story going? How is it progressing? It's the same way I do quilt design. You know, when I'm designing a quilt, that quilt stays in my head. How is that looking? How is that going? You know, is what's bugging me about it? What is not right yet? You know, it's the same thing. So, you know, there's nothing really magical to it. It's just a lot of discipline and a lot of habits more than anything else. So just got my acorn squash in the oven. So that's it for the updates around the house. I hope that you enjoy hearing about what's going on with my business, how I stay on track and continue to grow this and build this. Um, you know, it's an ever changing and evolving process. There's actually one more thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, just this week, past week, uh, Free Spirit and Westminster Fabrics, two of the biggest fabric manufacturers in the quilting world went out of business. Their parent company, Coates, decided to get out of the fabric business and shut them down. And these are some of the biggest fabric designers. These are the guys with the biggest booths at Quilt Market. You know, the people that you think have the most solid, stable, rock solid businesses. And their businesses are still fine, but their fabric, it's not, they don't have a manufacturer anymore. So, you know, everything that was basically uh, made up until now, what's whatever's out there that's available, there's no more going to be made, no more going to be printed unless they get licensed by another manufacturer. And this is one of those things, you know, um, things are constantly changing and evolving. And something that I have had to really tap into this week is just how am I going to deal with these changes? 
um, you know, I've seen it. I've been in business now for nine years and nine years ago I could put up some not so great YouTube videos and people would be interested in them and they come to the site and might buy a few products and help support us. And that really has changed a lot. And in really in the last three years, we found that to be more and more of a struggle. And I even caught myself uh, a few days ago, I was looking up recipes, you know, and find a recipe I like, scroll down to find it. And I would not really take in anything about where that recipe came from, you know, who wrote that and, and what, what is their business and all that kind of stuff. And so I think that things are changing and, um, we have to constantly adapt and constantly be flexible and willing to bend. And that's really where I see my business flowing and, and growing. And that's why I did things like writing a letter to my business is trying to figure out like, okay, where do I go from here? You know, how can I deal with these changes that are coming? Because if, you know, if fabric manufacturers are going out of business, if there isn't profit in that, you know, that's a sign that quilting in general is shrinking. It might not, it's never going to go away. Everyone loves to quilt, but um, things are changing and consolidating, which means the bigger guys are going to get bigger and more powerful. And the little guys, and yes, I am a little guy here, um, we're going to have to hustle. You know, we're going to have to work a little harder and figure out how we fit in this big world of quilting. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things. It is scary. And when I heard that news, it was just like, oh my gosh, how, how could that happen to those amazing designers? You know, these guys with the biggest booths, you know, they seem, they seem so powerful. You know, when you go to quilt market, you know, when you, you go to these shows and you see all this beautiful fabric and stuff. Um, and sometimes I question the way I, write, I, I run my business. I don't participate in quilt market very much. Uh, it's not really my business model. And, and it's been a hard choice to decide not to play that whole game and not to run my business that way. Uh, and it's not that this necessarily made me feel validated. It's more that I, I guess I gained a greater perspective that there is no, um, there's no guarantee. There is no um, silver bullet. <laughs> If you sign a contract with a publishing company, that does not mean that your book will be more successful than if you publish it yourself, you know, and, and at any point in time, the rules can change, the games can change, and we have to adjust and adapt and keep growing and changing and creating more. And that's the ultimate thing. I still, I want to create more. I want to do more things. And that's really where I think Mally the Maker is kind of, it's making me want to get in my sewing room and sew. It's making me want to play with new things like doll design, which I've never done before. So it's kind of scary, scary stuff, <laughs> but also really exciting too. And I think that's really where, what we need to tap into, um, what feels exciting, what feels new, what feels different and have the strength and um, courage to move in that direction. Uh, even if that means less time going into the things that we've done before, you know? So I hope that you enjoyed this introduction and, you know, hearing how I'm working on my business and thinking about things and responding to these changes that are coming to our industry. You know, I think we all have to flex and bend constantly in order to grow. I've been really thinking of images of trees. I want to get back to those tree projects I was working on a few months ago. So that might be something on the plate this week. We'll see. Dream Goddess is definitely going to get off the wall and back on the machine. That's my goal too. So I hope you enjoyed this introduction. And now here's the interview with Ann Holmes about no sewing until you quilt it, her awesome applique technique. Hello, my quilting friends. Leah Day here with Ann Holmes and Rachel, her assistant. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank Hi. you. Hi. Thanks for having us. Hi, Leah. It's great to talk to you today. Oh, thank you so much for being on. Now, a little introduction. Ann Holmes is an old quilting friend of mine. She was one of the very first quilters I met when I joined the Asheville Quilt Guild back in 2005 when she was president of that guild. 
Now, Anne is a stained glass artist and a quilt artist, and the creator of one of my favorite applique techniques called No Sewing Until You Quilt It. You can find her website at anholmesstudios.com. So let's get started talking about the story of how you created No Sewing Until You Quilt It. How did you come up with that technique? All right, as you were saying, you know, I was... Uh, uh, well, a stained glass artist where I was used to building a window on top of a, of a design for all those years. And I moved to uh, Asheville in 1998 and then got involved with the Quilt Guild. And I kept wondering how I was going to, um, I wanted to recreate some of my original designs in fabric, but the designs with all the curves and things, didn't lend itself to traditional quilting. Well, I joined a quilting bee, and one of my friends, a newcomer bee, told I had my ties. My father passed away before I moved here, and I had all his ties. I wanted to make something, uh, you know, using his ties. And a friend told me, well, you need French Fuse as a stabilizer. And so that's how I learned about French Fuse. And um, I never made anything with my dad's ties, actually, a <laughs> couple little tiny things. But the French Fuse, I had a, a drawing for something that I was going to do on my table. And I put French Fuse over the top of it, and you could see through it. And it comes in 60 inches wide. And so, you know, also in the Quilt Guild, I learned to do hand applique. Another one of my beginning uh, friends uh, got me into a Mary Sorensen block of the month. And I did that by hand. So I learned, you know, hand quilting techniques where you build it, you know, um, the pieces, they were interconnected. You didn't turn everything only the things that were on top were were stitched down but with my technique you know I could create a patchwork uh, background too it didn't have to be a solid piece that I was applicating on and so I started to experiment with that at first um, I would build a few pieces on top of my design with the French views on top and then I take it to the sewing machine and stitch it down. But in 2005, 2006, um, there was no way I was going to be able to finish my quilt for the quilt show. It's Rainbow Falls. You can see it on my home page on my website. It's uh, a landscape with a waterfall and uh, rhododendron flowers. And there was no way I was going to finish that if I had to take it to the sewing machine and stitch it and then uh, quilt it later on. And so I took a chance and I created the whole uh, piece, which was 36 inches wide by 80 inches long. Whoa. Uh, with no sewing in it. I built it all with um, on a French fuse foundation right on top of my working drawing. And I turned the edges with glue stick and sealed it down. And then after I built the whole top, then I made a quilt sandwich with the back and batting. And then I took it to the machine and did my first stitching and quilting all at the same time. And uh, ever since then, I've just been um, making lots and lots of quilts with this technique. Um, it's just a fun way to um, create almost anything that you can... Uh, you know, have a desire to create. So it's great for landscapes. And um, anyway, I'm right now, the current project that I'm working on is a, my stained glass uh, entry door that I made, oh my gosh, many, many years ago. And one of my friends has always liked that design. And so that's what we're building right now is we've expanded it to a, a lap quilt size, but I've I plan to um, show it on YouTube with my uh, YouTube channel. 
Excellent. Well, we'll make sure to link that up so everyone can see it. Uh, I would love to see that video. I just recently saw your video on connecting big pieces. And I want to be clear, like you can you can do bed quilts with no sewing until you quilt it. You can do bed quilts with this technique and not have to do any stitching until you're actually doing the quilting part, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, so you can easily work on your home a uh, sewing machine by building these quilts into units and then uh, joining the units. Excellent. So um, the connection technique was really unique in how you put it together. You kind of quilted up to a certain point and then you uh, started the joining process. You want to just kind of talk us through that process so everyone can kind of visualize it? Okay. Well, when I make a quilt in units, um, the first couple pieces that you want, well, the first, like on Happy in the Mountains is a project that we just finished for this year where we documented the whole quilt, building the whole quilt from the beginning stages of working with the paper to building the quilt top. And then we have uh, two sessions on joining the units. It's easier to see... Um, you know, on the YouTube than just an explanation, but generally I'm leaving about a two inch margin um, on one of the units. If I want to join the side unit to the middle unit, the middle unit can be stitched all the way to the edge. And then you leave open about a two inch margin on the, the side unit. And so um, you're, you establish, because you have a working drawing, you know exactly where the finished edge has to be on that quilt, and so that you mark that. And um, so in that two inch margin, you're turning under, you pull the back and the batting away um, from the uh, top. The top has the French fuse on it, and um, you, you turn it back to that what is supposed to be the finished edge of the quilt, and then you bring it up to where you've marked the finished edge on the, on like the center piece that you're joining it to. It's much easier to see and understand the description. I, in my book, I have a description, you know, with steps. Um, um, and this is, this is Rachel. This, um, I think one of the nice things, partially about Anne's technique, I mean, with the just building the quilt tops, is you can do really complicated curves. Any line drawing can become a can be made into fabric, which is pretty phenomenal. And then in terms of joining units, is we've done it a bunch of different ways. We've had, um, you know, king size quilts that we are joining on a grid, so it's really easy to line up. We've had pieces that um, kind of seem disparate, and then when you're adding them together, so you don't have kind of clear lines and um, and as a video within Happy in the Mountains about how we kind of use the working drawing to help us figure out how to line it up. And we've done it with, with curved pieces before. So um, the possibilities are pretty endless. That's so cool. And thank you so much for trying that description. I agree. That's one of those things that's just kind of, you got to see it. And as soon as I saw that video, I was like, oh, that's clicking for me finally. And so now I'm really wanting to make a big bed quilt. <laughs> So, well yeah. So have you ever um, sold any of your quilts? Like, uh, have you ever made any on commission? Is that something that you do, Anne? Oh, oh, yes, I have. Yeah, I did a stained glass for a lady um, many years ago, and she liked my work when she came to see the the stained glass, you know, before it was all leaded together um, uh, in my house. She saw some of the quilts that I was working on, and then so... Um, you know, she gave me a nice commission for her piece, and that's on my website too. You can see that it's uh, Once Upon a Starry Night. Excellent. And your stained glass, I can remember we were working on some stained glass back in, I guess this would have been 2006, that was installed in Asheville. So, do you have a few places that you can see your work? If somebody's traveling to Asheville, they could see some of your stained glass in buildings? Yes, um, at the Grove Park Inn, there's a piece, a little landscape piece. It's just a long, narrow piece 
once you go into the lobby and turn left, there's a showcase where they have their awards in it. And uh, so I made the stained glass that's above that uh, showcase. Um, and then I did a piece for the Arts Council downtown. I won a, a competition for that design, but the Arts Council has since moved and uh, removed the stained glass, and now it's a restaurant. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, and then Anne also did um, some fairly large stained glass pieces for a church in Ohio, correct? Yes. Yeah, I just finished that in 2015. They were installed. Um, one was a 12-foot diameter rose window made in nine panels, and then the, um, the Gothic window was 10 feet wide and 16 feet tall, and that was made in 28 panels. Wow. <laughs> She stays busy. <laughs> yes, definitely. So I can see why you have a quilting assistant. Uh, so Rachel, tell us a little bit about what you guys do together and how you uh, how you work together each week. Um, I started working for Anne in two thousand and ten. We were trying to we were trying to do the math before before you called um, for the interview. Um, so I think it's from two thousand and ten when Anne was was working on the book for the American Quilt Society. Um, and the first project I worked on with her was ended up being the cover quilt for that book. Um, and we've had a really, I think, great working relationship yes. since. So it's yeah. been, um, I mean, Anna is, is, is my mentor, and I feel very lucky to have her in my life. And, I mean, not only is she incredibly talented, but um, she's also just a really – um, sound person for me to spend so much time with. Um, I really, it's, it's really fabulous. And I, I mean, I had a background in, um, costume design and I've always worked in fabric before, um, before meeting Anne, but this is definitely, um, I think I probably, you could say I started as an apprentice and worked my way up to assistant. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was my lucky day. She was out in our neighborhood looking for her dog and um, she was taking a break from college, and uh, I needed help. You know, it's a lot of work to do all the projects for a book. Some of the pieces had to be done more than once, but uh, um, anyway, it was a challenge to get it all done, and Rachel ha has been excellent help. She's moved away a couple times and then come back, and I'm so grateful. <laughs> It's kind of like don't go, don't go. So, uh, yes. <laughs> have you have you made uh, have you made some quilts? Have you started making quilts, Rachel? Um, is is this what you do each week, or do you also do other things? I also do other things, but I'm with Anne at least once a week, if not twice a week. And then when we're in the kind of throes of a big project or under a deadline, we work more than that. Um, um I. About the Christmas quilt you're making for your grandmother. Yeah, that's true. I am. Um, I, I. So I am making pieces on my own. I am working on a. I, for a while, I've been working on this twenty block animal quilt, which you know, like I think all of us have some projects that just seem to take forever. Um, that is mine right now. Um, and then I've I've made some smaller pieces. I've made some baby blankets. I've made. Um, and then I'm currently working on. I took an Art Deco. Uh, design that I found in a book of um, of two swans basically facing each other. It's a mirror image, and um, like I was saying earlier, since any line drawing can be made into fabric, I decided to take that one on, and I've finished it, and it's uh, going to be a wall hanging for my grandmother for Christmas this year. So built all entirely with Anne's no sewing until you quilt it technique, and then um, stitched and quilted all at the same time on the machine. So. Um, excellent. I think it came out well. <laughs> yeah, excellent. So I know that you do the first step of stitching down, uh, like the zigzag stitch to secure the turned edge with invisible thread. You want to share some tips on invisible thread, Anne? Well, yes. Um, with my older Bernina, the most invisible thread you find is 0 .004 
Well, um, and my Bernina works fine with that. The Bernina has a little needle on the bobbin case, and when you uh, thread the eye of that little needle on the bobbin case, it automatically tightens the uh, the bot the bottom tension. Often you have little threads, uh, bobbin threads pop up. I usually use a 40 weight rayon thread in the bobbin. And um, so by just threading that eye of the needle, um, your bobbin pops don't come up. So that's great to know. But then also, um, I bought a Juki machine a, several years ago, and that machine just did not like my uh, invisible thread and the man at Juki told me to use a heavier invisible thread 0 0.005 or 0 0.006 and uh, that works very nicely now in that machine and then of course I just have to um, loosen the top tension on the Bernita I just turn the tension uh, down a little bit on the top thread and that has worked very nicely for me Excellent. So any tips for quilters that are wanting to sell your quilts? You mentioned that you did commissions and you've also done commissions with stained glass as well. So you would be a good person to say, like, uh, I see a lot of quilters um, underpricing their work, and, you know, and, and just not being able to set good prices. Any tips on that? Well, that is always such a hard thing to do. You know, I've um, before I moved to Asheville, Asheville's my first big town, and I did stained glass for years going out to craft shows and things. And, you know, um, luckily when I did that, I had some nice commissions uh, from that and some people that appreciated. But, you know, sometimes you just have to sell things just in order to have enough money to continue your art. Um, you know, by working at home, I didn't have to have a whole lot of um, overhead. You know, you can take um, um, some tax deductions for your space and stuff. So, um, you know, as you, I had a place, a booth downtown um, Asheville for a number of years in the Woolworth Walk. And, um, you know, I just set a price and, and luckily you can sell it. You know, doing stained glass for a number of years, you would always try to have a base price of like a, well, now it's probably $165, $175 a square foot for stained glass. And, um, you know, I've been trying to kind of price my quilts that way too. It just depends how many pieces are in it and because... Um, <coughs> The more pieces that are in it, of course, it's going to take more time. And uh, fabric is a whole lot cheaper than uh, stained glass <laughs> was. So you just, um, you know, you just have to set a price and say, you know, is this worth my time or not? Sure, completely. I completely and, agree with you that. You know, I'm paying Rachel a salary, too. So, you know, you have to take that into consideration. So... Yeah, yeah, it's all, it's, it all kind of goes into what it. somebody's willing to pay for it, you know, so. Mm -hmm, definitely. So um, you did write the book, No Sewing Until You Quilt It, and I love carrying this in my shop. Uh, so it's a wonderful book. It showcases so many quilts uh, with the No Sewing Until You Quilt It technique. Uh, and it sounds like making that book was a journey. You want to tell me a bit about that process? Well, um, first, you know... Um, for AQS, if you go on, well, they're not publishing books anymore, but if you go to another publisher, they'll have their requirements for, um, you know, what they want to see. AQS wanted me to write a chapter and send them two samples of my work. That's how it all began. And they actually rejected me the first time. I wash my quilts, and I learned that for photography, they don't often like to see a washed quilt because it's uh, it kind of shrinks it up a little bit, you know, it's a little wrinkly. And so anyway, I packed some stuff, and I 
I went to see the editor at a quilt show, and I showed her other samples of my work, some of the bigger quilts, and she said, you definitely need to reapply. So I did, um, and then she they accepted me. And so anyway, to, to get all the projects done, um, the, especially the bigger quilts, um, I was not going to make those more than once. So we shipped some of those units back and forth several times so they could do some of their own photography. That was the hardest thing to deal with. They didn't want to use a lot of my pictures. And then finally, they, they let me submit my pictures and they used a lot of my pictures from the book. The, these cell phones now take such good, incredible pictures. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I had to play around with lighting and stuff. So it, it was a challenge. Like you said, it's a process. You have a desire to do something, and you just work towards that goal and try to uh, jump over the hurdles. Well, I think even even before um, getting the bid from, from the American Quilt Society, you, you knew you wanted to write a book. Oh, you, yes. You yeah. know, had, oh, that's what was... You know, developed this technique that was so... It's, I mean, I really think it's so brilliant and, and wanted to get it out there in the world. And now, you know, so the book was kind of a first step and now you're doing the YouTube videos. And so I think it's been, you know, it's been a journey throughout the whole process of, of how to you know, best, you know, like we were talking about with the, with joining the units, there is a description in the book, but there is something I think helpful to the visual aspect that you've now moved into with your YouTube channel that, that really helps people see pieces come to light. Right. You know, just like, like you do, Leo, with your, with your channel where you can, people can see the reveal and can, you know, watch you with your free motion quilting. And there's, there's something about the visual aspect of art that I think um, YouTube has helped helped make it um, more available to people. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And, you know, it's, you know, so often I, I struggle to learn something without having, you know, to actually sit there and do it, you know, to stitch something out because I'm such a visual person. I don't think um, when I learned about Anne's technique, it was at a round robin at the Asheville Quilt Guild. Do you remember that, Anne? I do, and that I just looked on the back of that quilt. That was in 2006. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and so Anne was putting together this quilt and was demonstrating, and like in the matter of, I think it was maybe like a 10-minute presentation. 15-minute, yeah. Yeah, seeing her put it together. I and I, it right away. <laughs> yeah, and it was like the first time I'd ever seen curves you know, up until that point, I had never stitched, I never even attempted a curve because everything was, you know, straight lines, sharp angles, what I can piece, you know? So that was the first applique technique I ever mastered. And I keep coming back to it, you know, every once in a while, I'll try something new and I keep coming back to it because it's like, well, you know, why, you know, why try something new when this is, this works and it's fast and you get the nice reveal when you take all of the freezer paper off at the end. So I, that's the thing I love about it the most. Well, thank you. Uh, but I do reveal some of my fabric as I'm building because quilters are anxious to see what it's going to look like instead of waiting to the very end. You get a a uh, sneak peek by looking at the seam allowances around the edges. You know, I add a, a seam allowance to every piece with my magic button. It allows me to move the blade over approximately a quarter of an inch. When I roll my button along the edge of the freezer paper, it automatically adds a, a seam allowance. But um, anyway, we, we can reveal some of the, the fabric um, as we're building, we just have to leave the places uh, where something is going to be on top. You have to leave those pattern pieces. But as you're building, we can remove some of the former pieces. You just have to leave those um, edge pieces down so that you can, um, you know, because that saves your placement for the next piece. Anyway, I hope people will come and watch us on on YouTube, the Happy in the Mountains was a big project where we built a full-size quilt, and it took a, a long time to do it, and Rachel did excellent editing on it, um, 
So anyway, we hope other people will get excited about trying this in the new year. Absolutely. I, I will definitely make sure to link up those videos so that way people can easily find them in the show notes. So what are your plans moving forward? You've got a lot more quilts, it sounds like, in progress. Are you going to be continuing to make more stained glass? And then any more books in the works? Actually, um, I in the new year, I promised to repair something. I, I made something, uh, side lights and a transom for um, a friend many, many years ago. And actually, um, I got my first Bernina sewing machine from this lady, uh, Chris Gowan. She was in that beginning B with me. Um, and she was running to upgrade to a new uh, Bernina. And so I did some of that stained glass actually as a trade. Now she did <laughs> owe me some money, but that's how I got my first uh, Bernina. But now she's been married and has uh, children and um, she has this son that he and his friends were playing at the bottom of the staircase where the stained glass was and they broke the bottom. Oh no. Piece. So I'm, I'm going to be repairing that in the new year. <laughs> Um, well, and I think Anne, probably like all quilters, has an idea box that she adds things to. So, you know, I'll come into the studio and Anne will say, like, I'm pretty sure our next project is going to be, and we will have just started, you know, the current project that's on the table. And she's already thinking about what the next one will be. So it's always exciting. The idea wall, wall is always full. and um, <laughs> Yeah, I've been wanting to do a very large uh, landscape again. There's a couple... Uh, smaller landscapes in my book but um, again when I do this large landscape we'll make it in uh, sections and then join the the units uh, so anyway that's something that's been a, in the back of my brain for a while I've been putting ideas my design wall is more of an idea board than a design wall because I work on the tabletop Basically, I audition fabrics by just making a stack of fabrics around my work and my design wall. It's small, but it just is, <coughs> pardon me, just holds our ideas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, it sounds like you guys have got lots going on, and I'm so excited about what you're going to be coming out with next and the new videos you're posting to YouTube. So this is the question I try and ask everybody. Uh, what are you looking forward to most in the next five years? What's coming up? To do some more traveling. I'm 68 years old, and I'm hoping my husband is going to be retiring soon. <laughs> and so, little plug bird. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I just had two knee replacements this year, so I'm feeling a lot better about doing some hiking again. And... Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to put a lot of pressure on myself anymore. You know, it's just not worth it. I, you know, I had a stroke in 2014. And so, you know, I want to just um, do what I enjoy. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to do that and to share um, this technique. Um, so... Anyway, we'll, we'll just see. I don't know what the future holds. I'm going to enjoy my grandchildren and um, um, continue to work with Rachel as long as she can help me. And I'm, I'm so grateful for the help and support that she's given me all these years. Wow. And I'm so excited about you, uh, Leah, and all that you're doing. Oh, thank you so much, Anne. I really appreciate you coming on the show. So that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed learning more about Ann Holmes and meeting her assistant, Rachel, and hearing more about this awesome quilting technique, no sewing until you quilt it. Now, if you'd like to pick up a copy of Ann's book, we do carry it at leahday.com, and we include a yard of French fuse that's already cut for you so you can try out the technique immediately. So come and check this out at leahday.com slash no sew. You can find Anne's book 
and French Fuse too. And I used this technique to create Dream Goddess. This is the goddess quilt behind me. You can see a picture of it in the show notes. And I'm gonna be finishing this up very, very soon. But I just want you to know that you can do all kinds of things with this technique. It's really versatile and it creates very beautiful quilts. So I hope you learned a lot and you're excited to learn this new applique technique with me and Anne and Rachel. Definitely check it out and learn more at Anne's website too, annholmesstudios.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a great rating uh, wherever you listen to it, whether it's iTunes or another player, and leave a comment on YouTube or on the show notes. I love to get your comments and feedback every week. And if you're looking for more episodes, check them all out. You can find them all linked up together at leahday.com slash podcast. Until next time, let's go quilt.